Hello and welcome to Trekking and Beyond, a Star Trek podcast. I'm Monika. And I'm Andrea. And welcome to episode one of season four of Discovery. We are back to discovering Discovery. So guys, this episode is called Kobayashi Maru, but Kobayashi. And this episode takes us back to everything there is about Discovery. We get our crew back. We get Michael back. We get Book back. We get all the other crew (laughs) members back, except for Saru, because he's not there with Discovery, but he's still in the universe. So we're going to talk about that as we get closer. But basically, this episode picks picks up a couple of months after the last episode of season three, um, because of their great win at the stupid ending, but the great win and their great discovery at the end of season three, um, they're able to reconnect all of Starfleet and Federation with the distant worlds that they have been cut off from. They are able to provide a dilithium supply to these worlds to hopefully rebuild the Federation back to, his one, to the once former glory. They are opening up Starfleet Academy for the first time in 125 years. That gives me so many more questions than answers. But we're happy that we're getting students back into school, I guess, you know. So <laughs> let's talk about it. Let's get into it. What is your initial reaction? I'm happy they're building back up their force again. So that's good. And I'm so excited for this season. I feel as though I'm able to return to a book, like a new a sequel to one of my favorite books and I just read the first chapter and I can't wait to dive in but my mother's calling me to dinner and I can't finish the book so I'm like looking forward to I want to peek through and read the second and third chapters but I know I'm part of this book club and I will pace myself but I am so excited (laughs) to have these characters back and have all this drama and then white Michael will get red and uh, put in her place love that. and uh, <laughs> this journey and hopefully we'll bring Saru back in the loop. What about you? I liked this episode. It was a good first episode. It leaves the mystery ambiguous because we don't know, again, if it was a man-made thing, if it was a just like a random occurrence. Um, we don't really know what's going to happen in this uh, mystery. All I hope, though, is that this is going to be another season-long mystery, that the ending is not something that's so stupid as like, season three. That's all I ask. That's all I ask, is that if this is an actual, like, honest-to-God mystery, that the ending is, like, really, really, really thought through. Because I don't want to go through the whole thing of, like, the little season three and be like, okay, who was behind it? What? So I'm very excited. I'm happy to see all the crew again. It was like coming home. It was like watching this uh, episode was, like, coming home again and seeing all your friends and seeing how much that they either have grown Or just how they've, like, interconnected a little bit more since the end of season three. Um, It was great to see, again, Michael has this hubris, which she has earned in some rights now. Like, she has done a lot to earn um, where she's at, but that she still has a way to go. And I like to see that some other people are like, you need to understand that, Um, which is really fitting for this episode. Oh, for the, sorry, with the title of this episode, Kobayashi Maru. Let's go ahead and do a deeper dive of getting into this episode. This episode starts with uh, the Discovery arriving at a new world, at a strange new world. That was tagged to Monika because she said that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and they are basically meeting with this race of, I'm going to just say they were all attractive. I don't know what this race was. These but they butterfly were Butterfly people. Butterfly people, monarchs, whatever they were. They were a little attractive, all of them are small and say that. And they are trying to broker peace again like the Federation used to do. They're trying to offer the lithium. I've seen in other Star Trek shows, the Federation has a way of saying, we'll give you this and there's no string of, strings attached, but there's always strings attached, regardless of the fact that you want there to be. Um, because like, eventually you have to pick a side if there was a war. Like, hey, the Federation helped us. We got to help. There's always some type of strings attached. And I like how the butterfly people were seeing through it. (laughs) They were definitely like not like, they were not in awe of anything that Michael or Book was saying. Um, Talking about grudge, talking about how she's a queen and they keep her captive and they're going to free them. It was just a very funny, cute episode, like beginning part of the episode. It's interesting how Michael has moved up and ranked the captain, Mm -hmm. but she's not more diplomatic than before she is like, still at the same level she is not just has not 
I'll learn more about diplomacy in this time away. Like, it seems like we'll talk more about Saru later, but she is not um, able to help soothe, I think, the butterfly people's woes. If anything, she was making it worse <laughs> in this <laughs> negotiation and this peace deal. <laughs> so it just kept going, it just kept getting worse and worse and worse to the point in which they were on the run. And then they have to like leap off a cliff again and then again. <laughs> so, <clears throat> and then um, the butterfly people were firing on them. They were trying to escape. So. It was hard. It was just a comedy of errors there. And you mm -hmm. could tell that Michael is, still has a lot to learn. And she was hoping that Book would use his empathy thing and mm -hmm. help bail her out. Like, she knows that she has a problem. <laughs> but she thought that he was going to be able to help her. But evidently, they were not on the same page there. Um, and he didn't know how to also help. He made it worse as well. Yes. The only thing that he was, um, I think, really good at was the escape plan. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was very, I will say she did have a good point of going ahead and giving them the, the dilithium even while they were attacking. That was, it was a dumb actual move, a smart political move. Yeah. Um, because they, she had her people fix the satellites that would, increase and better the aim of the people who were shooting at them. To showcase, we were literally here just to give you the lithium. Like, we're literally here to, like, not ask for anything in return. Which I think it probably would have been better if they just gave them the lithium and then, like, left. And then, like, hey, if you want anything, just, like, reach out to us and we can talk later. Like, yeah. you're trying to bribe us to join Starfleet again. The Federation again. And I think that was bad timing on her part, which I think it worked out the fact that she just decided, okay, we're just going to fix our satellites and then we're going to run out of here and then hopefully everything works. And it did work out in her favor in the end. But still, you like you fixed their aim and then you ran. I would have ran and then fixed their aim. Like, I, I couldn't get that far. <laughs> uh, the whole time I was thinking two things. So I was thinking, why not just beam down the lithium and include a hologram or some other type of message <laughs> a diplomacy message they're attached to the lithium but like not interfere in their culture because you don't know how each world will react mm -hmm. and I was just thinking there's a better way of doing this and maybe sending Michael out is not the best way of handling this thing <laughs> but so there's that and then I was thinking oh she's stylish with this like burgundy leather jacket running I've never seen this one so um, I like the new burgundy leather away mission jacket. Look. <laughs> <laughs> um so after this initial um after this initial folly or whatever we want to call it and she says her signature now let's fly which i don't know if i fully like it i don't hate it it is good but i don't know if it works in every scenario right. i don't know i do like it but like at the end of, because, you know, in the beginning of this episode, they did a recap of, like, everything we saw last episode. And at the end, it was like, let's fly. That worked. It worked perfectly. But I don't know if this saying works in every scenario. Oh. Yeah, that's <laughs> something about, like, a catchphrase. But they are flying. So. Yeah, they are. And so, I don't know. I guess I didn't get the same um feel like I got in the first one when she right. said, let's fly. I was like, okay. And then let's fly. I'm like, uh, I don't know if you didn't say it differently or not, but I need I need that same gravitas when you say it. Because yeah. otherwise, I'm like, I don't know if that works because this isn't that type of scenario. But I mean, they were escaping. Not really, though, because they were on this. It's just me. Maybe that's just me. I was like, I didn't get the same um feeling that I did the first time I heard it. Because now we're used to it, too. Um, I don't know. I was thinking about the fact that, like, Saru hasn't happened yet this is a moment yeah so for me it was like a little heartbreak it's like oh okay it just reminded me <laughs> well speaking of Saru we next get to go to Kanama Kanamar and we see the council and I was very shocked to see the Ba'u were had like representatives that they are living in a more peaceful type of scenario of world and it was very interesting because they got the dilithium and they were, like, I guess, uh, discussing what to do with it. And so Carl was like, look, I ain't there anymore. I can't blow it up. I'm like, again, this ain't my, like, nothing's going to happen again. 
and then they called for the Grand Elder, and Saru came out. And I have to say, this man has made me hate him, has made me love him, has made me hate him again. And I have to say, seeing him come out, yes, I'm the Grand Elder, I was just like, okay. Like, and now technically he's the oldest person on Kanemar. But like, is he though? Like, he is, he is chronologically, but like mentally he's not. And so it's very interesting <laughs> to, because like, no, I, I, I say that to me, like there are other people on the planet who are probably actually older than him right. mentally. Right. And when it comes to like, okay, you're, you're giving this whole scenario, you're giving this whole perspective from a time when your people were oppressed and from a time that's different, which is still great to have that different personality, but it's just like, interesting it was beautiful to see him as a grand elder but i was like but are you because you have a di you have a different set of wisdom but it's not the same type of wisdom like it's from a different point of view which is always still good to have more than one point of view but again you're coming from like a whole different world than what this canamar knows i was thinking of the fact that maybe he knows some story some folk tales some other history that just hasn't passed down especially during oh, yeah. that time with the baul because there was such a short lifespan for mm -hmm. his civilization back then. But I was thinking that really Saru's character has evolved so that he become he became the elder. But then Sukau is older, but still does not have the maturity. You could kind of tell mm -hmm. in his voice and how he's acting that he hasn't grown up a lot in three months. It's hard to, three mm -hmm. to five months or whatever. Um, it's hard to grow up by 90 some years in a period of time. But um, it's interesting to see how like one character has now become much more respected. Sukal seems to be part of the council, but is um, still needs some, um, some guidance, although he seems to be interested in... Um, going out on his own now that is very true that is very that's very true and we see um uh, michael talking at um the opening ceremony of starfleet academy reopening sorry and i just have to say well one we see that we, we hear that starfleet went from 38 to 50 i think like into the 59 members which is great in a couple months they've already like added um and they're growing um they're being more connected but I just have a question. If there was no Starfleet Academy, how are there still Starfleet members 125 years later? Like, I just, I guess, I, did they mention this in the last season? I, just, I guess I just mentioned, figured the Academy was, like, moved off of Earth and was, like, hidden, but there was still an Academy. So I was confused at that point when they were saying they were, when they mentioned they were reopening the Starfleet Academy. Because, like, where did everyone else come from? I felt as though there wasn't a lot of formal training before it was just kind of ad hoc because there was just, they were in survival mode and they were really limited to that outpost. Mm -hmm. And even there was Starfleet officers away, but didn't know, was, weren't truly trained and didn't know how to communicate yeah. with the Federation. So I felt like they didn't have anything official, like any training academy. They were probably training people as they go, like when they were bringing in Discovery in, and they didn't send them out for training. Because <laughs> <laughs> it made me, like what really hit it on the nail on the head was when they met the president of Starfleet and she mentioned she got her training, like working with her father. And so I was like, oh, I guess I just assumed there was like a, like online course join Starfleet like <laughs> and it's not and you're right it, it, it probably was okay you have training and you have experience and you want to help people you're a member you're an ensign so it's very um interesting because I don't know I guess I just assumed and it's like oh we're reopening the academy you're an admiral how did you get here <laughs> everyone else died and just moved up <laughs> I was like it was 125 years ago so like are we keep, is it like a family thing my father was an admiral i'm an admiral my father was an ensign i'm an ensign like <laughs> where are we getting our people from <laughs> i did catch one quick line in which bryce mentioned that he was going to be away for a few months learning and so they brought in a different 
um, person to replace him on the bridge. Mm -hmm. uh, but other than that, it didn't seem like anyone else was getting any additional training. Yeah, <laughs> Which would have so been an op excellent opportunity to learn more about this whole galaxy and all the changes. <laughs> There's still so much to learn about the future. I feel like that you can that you need more than three months to do. Granted, they're all like certified geniuses, so maybe they learned it faster than other like than like you know I would. But I just still feel like okay, maybe like I don't want the, the whole crew broken up forever. But I feel like you have resources and knowledge that no one else does, and just like they have resources and knowledge that you don't fully understand either. I feel like a little more integration should be happening, right? And yeah. that's not happening. So I did like to see that um, Bryce was on the USS Curry, I think it was, right. for a couple of days. Like, I'm hoping maybe they just do it on a one-off. They switch people off on a one-off because it's just like, right. maybe oh. they should be <laughs> that's a, so Maybe that's where Jet disappears. Maybe Jet's just on an exchange program. <laughs> Holy crap, where's Jet? <laughs> right. <laughs> and then, um, so I noticed, so really quickly, I noticed that uh, during the away mission, uh, Jean was in the captain's chair instead of Tilly. And yeah. so then I was like, oh, when did Jean get promoted? What happened here? I was like, <laughs> why is Tilly off to the side? Uh, <laughs> rewind. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, there's a lot of questions and we need answers. Now we're going to talk about um, what the bulk of this episode is. And the first thing, before we get into like the heavy uh, nitty gritty parts, we're going to talk about the fact that Book, for some reason, is still on the ship. But then he decides to leave to go back to his home planet to uh, celebrate in um, the coming of age of his best friend's son, which I thought was a little cute little thing because, you know, he doesn't, Book doesn't really have any other family. He considered this man his brother. Mm -hmm. And so this was a great way of including book back into the family of allowing him to explain to like technically his nephew um wh like what's going on the importance of it the the root that encompasses the entire planet that um and to take their the sap from it i think it was yeah. and to wear it around his neck forever um i thought that was a very very touching moment and i was like all right book you can stay in this you can stay in the show that was cute that was worth it <laughs> What did you think? <laughs> so it led me to two things. So first of all, I was thinking, oh, this is similar to a bar mitzvah. So the young oh, the yeah. young boy is like coming of age and it's a mm -hmm. ceremony gets all his family together, supporters to help um, nourish him to his next step in life. And so that, and then also what happened to Book's container with the sap in it? So mm -hmm. um, the young boy asked him and... Um, kind of stalled and so we don't know so it might be part of this mystery for this season is to find out more about book and um this planet and everything <laughs> yeah no i definitely definitely agree um so after the whole celebrations we're back with michael now but after the whole celebrations of opening up starfleet we um they receive a sos a distress call from deep space repair repair beta six the president like decides I'm going to go with you on discovery and Michael's first uh, reaction is hold up no you're not <laughs> and this is a fatal flaw that I think they, the writers keep giving Michael and I don't get why they keep giving this to Michael they have her flip flop on what regulations she follows when the president of, this, of the federation says I'm going to get on your ship you don't say no like <laughs> Because even the Admiral looked at her and was like, Michael, like, <laughs> if she wants to get on your ship, she can get on your ship. It, it's like they're making Michael unable to play politics, and she needs to be able to play politics to be a captain. There's always politics at play in the work in the work area. Like, we, like they always say, you always have to figure out office politics. It doesn't seem fair, but you need to know it. And it's like, why can't they let Michael have the attributes that they give all the other captains of knowing knowing or at least being aware of office politics thank you good point uh, so she served on two ships really and she hasn't really worked the way up and got and i think the way like pike and other captains have mm -hmm. her she's achieved success by overcoming a lot of obstacles and being able to like i don't know save the universe and everything like that 
but she hasn't learned empathy. She hasn't learned the politics. She hasn't learned the other kind of gritty aspects of being a captain. And that's very clear in this conversation. <laughs> and she seems to think that like she runs Discovery, not thinking that, well, Discovery is part of the Federation. So like there's someone at Trump's shoe here. Yeah. Um, and even ignoring the fact that Vance is there. So Vance can trump Michael as well. Mm -hmm. So uh, Michael's like disillusioned there. She, she seems to think that she's out on her own and can do her own thing. But we've seen that time and time again, yeah. I think, since the Senju. Like she gets, it's like, they, it's like the writers have her get it, but not understand it or not really understand how it truly affects her day-to-day -day life when it comes to how things are done. So then we, so the Discovery, they go on Black Alert and they go ahead and jump to uh, the area where the deep space repair si beta six is. And that thing is just like spinning out of orbit. It is just like, and they're trying to get closer to it. They're trying to raise comms and nothing's really working. And we see that Tilly and Amara and Dara, <laughs> they, they get onto the ship and they're trying to fix everything. And it's basically a whole cluster because now they're getting hit, pummeled with debris and the Discovery can only put the shields over it and the uh, beta six for like 15 minutes and it's they're all going to hell in a handbasket so quickly michael is refusing to give up and she's refusing to allow anyone else to die which is a good attribute what we're going to talk about in a moment it, it, which is a good attribute um we see that michael then says okay i'm just going to take a little shuttlecraft over there and like open the doors because they're stuck and they can't escape until he's trying to explain to the commander on beta six that they can't go into an area that has no atmosphere because everyone's going to die because they don't have evil suits and he's like that's, that's only not an option <laughs> <laughs> like the are, what, what that whole scene to me reminds me of every movie where the smart person does the dumbest mistakes because they let fear overrun their decision process it's like you're not thinking logically or critically and they get back on the ship three people died four people injured but nine came back, which is still a win. Um, we see that the president has a conversation with Michael, and Michael's overviewing the fact that they still lost people. And the president is focusing on the people they sur that survived. My and they get into a conversation of the Kobayashi Maru, and Michael explains the point is this, that you never pass it, so that when you go back to your room later and think about it, and think about all the ways that you can fix it. And the president is talking about the fact that sometimes it makes you accept the fact that you can't always win. And Michael almost seems adverse to that idea that you can't always win. And so the president lets her know that it's because of her actions here that she's not up for promotion. And then Michael gets really talking like, well, I wouldn't have left Discovery anyway. Honey, again, you're not getting politics. <laughs> so this whole the whole recovery of Deep Space Six sorry deep space repair beta six is a was like a test an unknown test for michael to see, see if she was ready to be the captain of the new starfleet's next generation sport drive ship it's because the uss voyager j it was a test to see if she could be the captain of it and she failed because she technically failed the kobayashi maru you can't always save everyone and you have to accept that. So let's talk about this whole scene. <laughs> Detmer, we know, is an excellent pilot. Yes. I think she could have gone on this mission and been successful because we've seen her I, get us out of a lot of different bets. I don't understand why. Well, I know she said that she has the most years of ex most time logged in that particular or aircraft, but she should be the one to pilot discovery and to make these other tough decisions. Mm -hmm. So Michael just thinks that she can solve all of these problems herself. And I think that was also part of um, the president's concern there is that you're, you can't fix it all part. I, I agree. I agree with the president. Michael's not ready. Michael's not, wasn't ready for this mission and the whole butterfly people. So <laughs> I think, uh, and also, ooh, it seems like Tilly and Indira are, like, Tilly's mentoring Indira now. Yeah, it's so, so cute. Yeah, so, so it was so cute, cute to see uh, the two of them beam over. But then I was thinking, 
I'm still confused. Is Tilly first, second in command? Or is Tilly now back to like Lieutenant Cap Commander? I um, think she's back to Lieutenant Commander. So they talked right. about it at one point. I can't remember where, but I think, and, she, I think she's back to being Lieutenant. Right. And Jean was never really addressed as like the new number one. Mm -hmm. um, the president of the Federation didn't sit in the captain's chair. So I think that's also another like gray area is exactly who's going to run Discovery when Michael's away on these rogue missions <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and ensure that that person has the experience that's needed. There's a lot. There is um, a lot that's not fully explained yet. And I'm guessing I'm hoping in a couple more episodes that we get some explanations to um, why the number like, how, like is he number one or is he not and if he's not why does he get to sit in the captain's chair it was great to see that hugh and paul still have that like father figure over indira um like how like where's indira you gotta focus on your job right now <laughs> um like their first their first concern is their um is indira and i think that is adorable little fathers Going back to the president, it's also, like, I want so much for Michael. Like, I do. I want I want so much for her. And I just feel like I don't know if the writers want so much for her because they're giving everyone else their learning experiences that Michael should um to be a better captain. Because like you said, Dittmer should have been the one to pilot because a true captain can allow someone else to take the reins. And we've seen... And other episodes of other people trusting other people to do the work that that they normally did. And I think it's something that Michael needs to learn to trust your crew. Because how can you be a captain if only you believe your way is right? Or only you can do it correctly. Um, it's something that we've seen in every a, a different version of it in every season with Michael. And it's like she never learns you don't have to be the person that does it. Other people can do it. And the president even talks about the fact that in her file, Michael has it that she has a pathological need to save everyone due to her, um, due to how she was raised, how she grew up, what happens in the trauma in her past. I hate to say it, I really do. They never let Michael take constructive criticism well. She always has to fight back, bite back, or say something back. And in response to everything the president says, she said, well, I wouldn't have wanted that anyway. She says it in a respectful manner, but it's still like, you're not, anyone else would have said, I disagree, like they could say professionally, I understand where you're coming from. While I personally disagree with that assessment, I will take it under, under advisement. There's other ways to, to professionally disagree with someone without saying, well, respectfully, discovery's my home. I wouldn't have taken it anyway. And it's like, if you're assigned as a captain, that's you go where we tell you to go. Right. Yeah. This isn't your, and that does also doesn't bode well to the president yeah. because you're basically telling her you're putting discovery over orders. Sorry, you can't see my hands. Uh, you're putting discovery over your orders. And if she orders you to leave discovery to go to another ship, are you going to resign from Starfleet to stay on discovery? Like, what are you going to do? Like, I don't think they allow Michael to truly think through her actions or her words and grow like she should. Yeah, I'm hoping that we'll see more of Michael become a, I hope we see Michael become a better leader over the course of this season. I mean, each season she's getting better. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's just taken us a while yeah. to get there, but this is so much better than the first season of Michael. But it's tough because we also just saw Captain Pike like embrace his crew with the battle with the Gorn and say, okay, anyone have a plan? Mm -hmm. Anything like all options on the table, let's let's share ideas. And we've also heard Leon disagree with Spock and disagree with, with Pike. But it's respectful. It's never like the way that Michael's doing it. So, <laughs> yeah, and if but she truly it, has it, a better it, idea, they go with it. Right. So it's, yeah. Right. But he's um, allowing other members of the crew to be engaged in that. And it seems like Michael makes all the decisions on Discovery. She 
very seldom asks other people unless she's like hit a roadblock and then she'll ask Tilly or she'll ask someone else. Not at the, I don't know, the initial spark of the problem. Yeah. I, I agree. I agree. And it, it's it's heartbreaking because she is our she is she is our first black female lead in a Star Trek show. She is amazing in her own right. If they allow her to be in her sweet spot, as my pastor likes to say. And I don't think leadership is truly her sweet spot. Um, and that's okay. It's okay if she's not the captain. It's okay because sometimes people don't thrive in being the leader, especially if they cannot hand off the reins to someone else, then you can't be in leadership because if you're the boss, you have to trust your team to get the stuff done if you're not there. And if you always have to be the one to do it to prove to everyone that you can save them, why would I ever put you in charge of someone? Because you're never actually in charge of them. You're just doing it yourself. Right. And let's face it too, Discovery was originally a science vessel. Michael wasn't on the whole, I think the directory or the track for, to be an ambassador, to be like part of a uh, a battleship. <laughs> I think it was more in line with science and uh, scientific research. Yeah. And she's, I think, outside of her comfort zone, but she doesn't want to admit it. I have to say, I would not be upset to see if she loses the captaincy. I, I, I know she would be upset, but I wouldn't be upset because I need, this is going to sound really awful, people, and I'm so sorry. I don't want a token captain. I want the person to be qualified. The president said a good thing, that the pendulum swung very heavily in one direction because of your past actions, but that does not necessarily mean you're a leader. She said, I, and that, that's such a good, that's, it's a good thing for a lot of people. Like just because you're good at one thing doesn't great successes in the past doesn't translate to leadership. But enough about that because I'm I have that bone to pick with the writers and I'm gonna hope that one day they see the see the error of their ways and just give Michael Burnham like, oh, this is her. She's perfect and amazing and like has her understand the world can work without her. So find your seat spot. One more point before think that that the president of the Federation was also kind of hinting towards the fact that not everyone died, but the commander of that deep space repair location, that individual died on mm -hmm. behalf of the, the other crew. So sent everyone else out. Yeah, he had some sketchy decision and he wasn't, he wasn't good on his feet, but he passed away and there was, I don't know, sometimes the the captain has to be the last person on the ship, mm -hmm. right? The, it shouldn't be the first one off. Yeah. <laughs> so um, in this case, this commander died, but that doesn't mean that we negate his uh, his sacrifice for mm -hmm. the rest of the crew. Agreed. I 100% agree. So as we get towards the end of this episode, we get to our true heartbreak that I did not see coming. Um, so while Book was still a Quajon, there was a little bit of uh, weirdness, I guess is the best way to describe stuff happening. And we see that Book gets onto a ship and rises up, and he's trying to figure out what's going on in the atmosphere, what's going on around Quajon. And he's hit by this force, and we don't see what the force is, but it basically knocks him off of like where he was standing, knocks him over some controls, and the ship goes on autopilot to find the discovery. Basically, right after Michael sort of put in her place by the president, she gets the announcement that a uh, book ship is here and the AI sent the, the AI flew him here. And that tells everyone something's wrong. And so we the next scene is book like I need you to find like putting the uh, the coordinates for Quajon um because something's wrong and they can't find it. And he's like, What are you talking about? You did it wrong. And she's like, I did it. I'm I don't know what's going on. And they find the closest entity that should be where Quajon is, is destroyed. And we don't see it first. I think they did such a great job of showcasing the horror before show it, showing the actual horror. Because we see everyone's face. And even the president. Like, we see everyone's reaction to, like, oh, my God. Like, this was no one. Whatever they expected, this was not it. And to see... To see the world and to reflect back onto Book's face, Book to say, like, they're all gone, 
their dad. Like he just lost every connection, everything. That was, I was so mad at the ending. I was like, are you serious? You could have just ended on a high note and this started next episode. <laughs> Well, I think they're trying to show that there's a problem in the galaxy. Yeah. Because something happened with some birds. Yeah. Also, they're on the planet. And so something was going off with the axis of the planet or in something else uh, where this where this deep space repair um, yeah. Yeah. was something else was going out on, and but they're not sure. So this could lead to more scientific research to find out what's happening. Hopefully it's not another burn. Hopefully it's something that they can fix. They have to. <laughs> they have to because we saw that it already messed up the, like you said, beta six, it destroyed Quajon. Who could be next? What's going to be next? There's so much you can do in Discovery. There's literally, we're in the future. We don't need a season long. Well, I don't need a season long arc anymore you set it up we, we know we know well i'm interested in a season arc because i also feel like the short tracks are like anthologies like short stories that mm -hmm. kind of come together when one theme but then i feel like strange new worlds is more like those short like harlequin or like nancy drew and hardy boys like they're all separate books but they're short easy reads i feel like discovery is that trilogy that that J.J.R. Martin like, <laughs> series that you just can't put down and you're waiting for the train wreck and the drama and all the suspense and you're pulling your hair out and you're reading your book underneath like, the how covers many of those can we up all night too. In our lives? How many of those can we really do we really 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 read in our lives? <laughs> like there's only so many of those we can get through because they're so huge. That's well, just my well, take. Up, at least we have variety. The spice of sure. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so final thoughts as we come to the end of this episode. I'm Great. excited. We'll find out what this anomaly is all about. And uh, all of my major characters are back. In four episodes. <laughs> <laughs> She's going to kill me one day, guys. <laughs> you heard it here first. Um, I'm excited too. I did miss Discovery. It was, it, like I said in the beginning, it was feeling like coming home. It was, it was great to see everyone again, but I can't help but compare them sometimes. So I just, I, four episode series, four episode uh, mysteries, please. Four episode mysteries. That's all I'm asking. That's all I'm asking. I'm, I understand the mysteries need to be long, but did they need to be a season long? The world may never know. <laughs> Thank you for listening to us or watching to us if you see this on YouTube. Um, as always, I'm Andrea. And I'm Anika. And live long and, and prosper. prosper.